So today is October 22, 2017, and it is the new moon of the eighth Hebrew month. And um, we will start with asking our Heavenly Family to guide us, and then we'll get into our subject. Heavenly Family, thank you for guiding us. Thank you for being patient with us and correcting us of our many misconceptions. Thank you recently also for teaching us how to think and showing us that we have really given in to so many fallacious ways of reasoning. But again, thank you for showing us a better way. Please help us to live by it. Help us to live a life of love and truth. And through this meeting, help us to understand reality better and to be bound together in love. Guide us. Help me to clearly explain the ideas which we need to consider today. Thank you. We ask this, B'Shem Tzemach, who were he, in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, the new moon of the eighth month. Um, I think it was this morning, as I was pulling up some things in relation to this, that I realized that uh, it was the new moon of the eighth month in which we had the study called Qumran and the Line of Truth, which introduced a whole body of ideas for us to consider, which have played a large part in our conference calls ever since. And this meeting is kind of going to be introducing something that is in some ways similar to that, So, before getting into exactly what it is, I just want to point out some things about our journey of realization. So, all of us and most uh, Protestants have, have really viewed things in terms of the 66 books of the Protestant canon as you all know. And for most Protestants, that's really the voice of God in the world, those 66 books. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we learned that the voice of God is not restricted just to those 66 books because even within those 66 books, it describes the need for the gifts of the Spirit, in particular the gift of prophecy. And so Adventists also accept the writings of Ellen White as containing the message of God. And so we've kind of looked to a period after the 66 books of the Protestant canon were written and seen that, hey, actually there's God speaking in latter days as well. And, of course, as branches, we understand that it's far more than just God speaking through one woman. It's actually a whole series of messages and messengers. And we even understand that prior to Ellen White, there's the Reformation, and yes, there was a dark ages, so to speak, but God had people all the way through And we kind of see things in more of a continuity, perhaps, than many other believers. And so we've kind of had that understanding for a while. And then in this message, what we've done is kind of closed another gap. So we have this gap after the New Testament. And then in this message, we've closed a gap before the New Testament. It's kind of between the Testaments, as it were. We've looked at apocryphal literature, and then there's all the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a whole library of writings 
from before the time of Jesus, but after the time described in the quote-unquote Old Testament. So, what we want to talk about today is kind of closing another gap. And uh, it's really a big subject, and there's so much about it that we have to learn, myself included. And so I'm just going to lay out some of the basics of this idea, and I'm sure in future studies it will be greatly refined. And this is so, so similar, really. This is so similar to Qumran and the Line of Truth. In that study, I showed a number of connections and similarities between the sectarian literature of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament in order to show, look, there's some sort of connection. The Qumran movement was in some way a forerunner movement to the Nazarenes. And we didn't really know what it was and what the connections were. And then as we went on, that understanding became more developed and more nuanced. And we can see how there is a variety of literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of which represents a message which Jesus and the Nazarenes accepted, and some of which represents material which they would not agree with. And the relationship is that the early Qumran material is like parent material to the Nazarene material. And then there's other writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are like sibling material. So let's just put it like this. The teacher of righteousness is like a common root shared by the Nazarenes and the Essenes. So the Essenes in the days of Jesus traced themselves back to the teacher of righteousness, and the Nazarenes in the days of Jesus traced themselves back to the teacher of righteousness, but they are both branched off in different directions from the teacher of righteousness. It's not as though you have the teacher of righteousness and then the Essene movement in the days of Jesus, and then the Nazarenes coming through that Essene movement, which was contemporary in their day. No, they, they didn't agree with everything that the Essenes in their day said, even if it was something that they said a hundred years beforehand. They had kind of departed in thinking... Uh, at an earlier point, or at least the point of departure is earlier. So, I explain that because it will be helpful in understanding some of the possible relationships we have between Israelite literature and other literature that we are about to consider. So, what we're looking at is the line of truth pre-Israelite. So everything, everything that we've been studying in this message, whether we are looking at the law of Moses or whether we are looking at the Psalms of David or we're reading the prophecies of Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah and coming all the way up through into the days of Jesus and beyond, This is all within the realm of Israelite ideas and Israelite literature. But today we're going to consider, well, what about before the Israelites? Because in reality, the Israelites were only really a people from about 1200 BCE. At least that's the usual time that historians and scholars attribute. Some will go back as far as 1400 BCE. But still, that's not 
all that long ago. <laughs> in some respects it is, but in terms of the history of the world, there's a lot before that point. And so the question is, you know, here we are. We thought that God was speaking through these 66 books of the Protestant canon, and then we realized, oh, no, God was speaking after that as well. And, oh, well, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God was actually speaking there, too. So now, well, wait, what about before? I mean, we have all this time. In fact, the oldest writings known to man are 5,000 years old. So we have a couple thousand years worth of writing prior to the existence of the Israelites. So should we not consider whether there is a line of truth that is preserved there. And the fact is, for many, many hundreds of years, we had no writings from that time other than Egyptian hieroglyphs and other Egyptian writings. But what about the other literature? What about the literature from the places where Israel came from? What about literature from the land of Canaan and from Mesopotamia and from further north in, uh, in Syria? Well, now, over the past, well, it's over 100 years now, really, but especially in the past 100 years, a lot of literature has been found from ancient Sumer, from Ugarit, from all over the ancient Near East. So now we have ancient Babylonian literature, not just like Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, but we have Babylonian like way, way before that. And we have uh, Assyrian literature, which also in Assyrian writings, we have older writings preserved. There's Canaanite literature, Hittite literature, all of these different literatures that we have that go before the Israelites. Now, we know that when the Israelites were around, they opposed much of the ideas in the peoples around them. But one thing that we need to ask is, did Israel just pop out, out of the blue? Like, did they just suddenly show up and were just opposed to everything? Or did they come from within a tradition which perhaps had become corrupt when they had their inception, but which was actually a true tradition. This is something for us to consider. Now, in a sense, this whole topic is something that should be obvious to us anyway, because when we read Genesis in particular, with its three sources, three primary sources combined, we see that the ancient Israelites clearly viewed themselves as coming from a line of not only biological ancestors, even though, of course, they wouldn't use that term, but of people who were faithful to God. So, of course, Abraham was not an Israelite. Isaac was not an Israelite. Jacob would be the first one who might be said to be an Israelite because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. But really, we'd, it's probably better to start with Jacob's children. They might be the first Israelites. But, of course, Isaac, Abraham, and then we keep going back in, you know, reading in Genesis, and there are all these people that are mentioned Enoch is there, and um, Noah, and Methuselah, all of these, quote-unquote, patriarchs. But none of them were Israelites. So, and then, of course, we have the question of, is there more besides what we are aware of? And I think that everyone in the message at this point realizes that, of course, we need to be open to the idea that there is more beyond what we are aware of. So I'll mention something that is more 
beyond what we are aware of, but still in the books with which we are familiar. So one of these things I'll mention is from the book of Ezekiel. Now, in Ezekiel, there is a a passage in Ezekiel 14 which describes Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now, the strange thing about that uh, collection of names is that Noah is a pre-Israelite figure. Job is also a pre-Israelite figure. But Daniel is definitely an Israelite figure, not only Israelite, but also a Jew. And he was a contemporary of Ezekiel. And it's long been thought that Ezekiel is referring to Daniel, his contemporary. However, there are some issues with that. In Ezekiel, again, he pairs Daniel with Noah and Job. But in Ezekiel, in Hebrew, the strange thing is that he does not actually say Daniel. It's Dan-el. There's no E. It's not Daniel. It's Dan-el. And I know in most English translations it says Daniel because that's who most people have assumed it to be. But in Hebrew, it's actually Dan El. Now, this is really interesting because in ancient Canaanite literature, there's a figure known as Dan El. And he's uh, connected with Tyre. Now, in Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel references this person named Dan El connected with Tyre. And it seems to be the same Dan L referred to in Ezekiel 14. So, you know, Ezekiel 14, I won't go and read the whole passage, but you can read it uh, in verses 12 to 23. And then it's Ezekiel 28, verse 3, where he mentions Dan L again. So Dan L is a figure known in Canaanite stories in a writing known as the story of Achat. And that was uh, found in the ancient city of Ugarit. And uh, it's known today as Ras Shamra is that place. So there's a whole bunch of literature that was found at Ras Shamra. And that's ancient Ugaritic literature. And basically it's Canaanite literature. But it's from before the Israelites came around. Before there were Israelites. So why is it that Ezekiel would reference this guy, Dan L? And then there's also the book of Jubilees, clearly a Jewish writing. And he also mentions this figure, Dan L. And this is what he says, uh, the author of Jubilees. Jubilees chapter 4, verse 20. And in the twelfth Jubilee, in its seventh week, he took for himself a wife, and her name was Edni, the daughter of Dan El, his father's brother, as a wife. So that's referring to Enoch taking Edni, the daughter of Dan El, as his wife. So this Dan El figure is mentioned several times in this. Uh, Canaanite literature and mentioned several times in Israelite literature. So why is there that similarity? Well, also, uh, there's another parallel here, just in terminology. In the story of Akat, again, this Canaanite literature, there's a saying referring to Dan El. It says, he judges the case of the widow, adjudicates the case of the fatherless. Well, there's just similar terminology to that that's in Israelite literature like in Isaiah 119 which says defend the fatherless plead for the widow a lot of these 
values that are looked at as good values in Canaanite literature are carried on in Israelite literature. I'll read another thing from Canaanite literature, and you'll hear the similarity. This next one is one that I have actually mentioned before on a call. This is from something, uh, some literature that is either from the second millennium BCE, or it may even go back as far as the third millennium BCE. It says, When you smote Lotan, the fleeing serpent, making an end of the twisting serpent, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so it talks about Lotan, the fleeing serpent, and then it also refers to him as the twisting serpent. Well, now look at Isaiah 27, verse 1. In that day, Yahweh will punish with his sword, hard and great and strong, Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisting serpent. So, Lotan, the fleeing serpent, Lotan, the twisting serpent, and then we have Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent. Very, very, very similar. Now, I'll give you another one that's very, very striking from the same body of literature in Canaanite literature. And I'm, I'm not giving all the references because we're not really used to the reference system yet. These are from something known as KTU 1.2. And this particular one that I'm going to read is from Roman numeral 4, lines 8 and 9. So I know that that's basically meaningless to us at this point because we're not familiar with this literature yet. But this is what it says. Lo, your enemies, O Lord. Lo, your enemies, you will smite. Lo, you will vanquish your foes. Okay, now read this, and I want you guys to really notice the similarity. This is from Psalm 92, verse 10. For lo, your enemies, Yahweh, for lo, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. Look how similar that is. Lo, your enemies, O Lord, Canaanite, (laughs) for the Israelite. For lo, your enemies, Yahweh. Canaanite again. Lo, your enemies, you will smite. Then in the Israelite one, for lo, your enemies shall perish. I mean, it's just so, so similar. This one is similar enough that it is probably the case that the author of the psalm is quoting the Canaanite literature. I mean, that's just far too similar. And there are many other points of similarity. Now, those things that I read so far are from Canaanite literature. Now I'm going to take a step back and look at things that aren't necessarily from Canaanite literature, but just broader ancient Near Eastern stuff. Just to show how much getting acquainted with this literature can be helpful. So there are a few things in Israelite literature which have been known for a long time to be based on other material from more ancient Near Eastern literature. And some of these ancient Near Eastern works are relatively well known. You guys may have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh and of Enuma Elish. These are probably the two most famous of these um, ancient Near Eastern bodies of literature or ancient Near Eastern works, aside from what ended up being preserved in the Bible. So I want to read to you guys the Epic of Gilgamesh right now. It's not super long. I know it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it sounds like it's going to be like, Homer's Odyssey or something like that. But, you know, we don't have fully preserved everything. And perhaps there's even more to this Gilgamesh work than I am even aware of. But I'll read part of this here. And just listen to the story and see if it reminds you of anything. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, the far off, 
As I look upon you, Utnapishtim, your limbs are not strange. You are just as I am. You are not strange at all. You are just as I am. I imagined you ready for battle. Yet, my arm... Dot, dot, dot. And you lie on your back. Tell me, how did you join the ranks of the gods when you sought life? Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Okay, now, now this person named Utnapishtim is going to relate a story to Gilgamesh. And listen to this story. Let me reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a hidden matter, a secret of the gods, let me tell you. Shurupak, a city you know of, and which on Euphrates' bank is situate, that city was ancient and the gods were within it. The great gods resolved to descend the deluge. They swore their father Anu, their counselor, the warrior Enlil, their throne-bearer Nunurta, their canal officer, Enugi. The leader, Ea, was under oath with them. He repeated their plans to the reed hut. Reed hut, reed hut, wall, wall, listen, reed hut, be mindful, wall. Man of Shurupak, son of Ubartutu, destroy this house, build a ship, forsake possessions, seek life, build an ark, and save life. Take aboard ship, seed of all living things. The ship which you shall build, let her dimensions be measured off. Let her width and length be equal. Roof her over like a hidden depth. I understand full well, I said to Ea, my lord. Your command, my lord, which you spoke just so, I shall faithfully execute. What shall I answer to the city, the multitude, and the elders? Ea made ready to speak, saying to me, his servant, Young man, do you speak to them thus? And it, it probably means, do speak to them thus. It's just an older way of phrasing it. So this is what um, Utnapishtim is supposed to say to the elders. It seems that Enlil dislikes me. I cannot dwell in your city. I may not set my foot on the dry land of Enlil. I shall go to the depths and dwell with my lord Ea. Upon you shall he shower down in abundance. Dot a dot of birds. A surprise of fishes. Dot a dot. Harvest riches. In the morning, spate of cakes. In the evening, rain of grain. With the first glimmer of dawn in the land, the land was assembling around me. The carpenter carried his axe. The reed cutter carried his knife. Dot a dot, the workman dot a dot. The houses made rope. The wealthy carried the pitch. The poor brought dot a dot what was needful. On the fifth day, I laid her framework. One full acre was her floor space. Ten dozen cubits each was the height of her walls. Ten dozen cubits each were the edges around her. I laid out her contours. I stretched out her lines. I decked her in six. I divided her in seven. Her interior I divided nine ways. I drove the water plugs into her. I saw to the spars and laid in what was needful. Thrice 3,600 measures of pitch I poured in the oven. Thrice 3,600 measures of tar did I pour out inside her. Thrice 3,600 measures of oil for the workers who carried the baskets, aside from the 300 measures of oil that the caulking consumed, and twice 3,600 measures of oil that the boatmen stored away. For the builders' bullocks were slaughtered, and I killed sheep every day. Fine beer, grape wine, oil, and date wine did I give the workers to drink like drinking water. They made a feast on the New Year's Day. I opened ointment, dispensed it with my own hand. On the seventh day, the ship was completed. Dot, 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 were very great. They brought on gangplanks, fore and aft. They came up her side, two-thirds of her height. Whatever I had, I loaded upon her. 
What silver I had, I loaded upon her. What gold I had, I loaded upon her. What living creatures I had, I loaded upon her. I made go aboard all my family and kin, beasts of the steep, wild animals of the steep, all skilled craftsmen I made go on aboard. Shamash set for me an appointed time. So this is Shamash speaking. In the morning when it spates in cakes, in the evening when it rains in grain, go into your ship, batten the door. End of quote from Shamash. That appointed time arrived. In the morning, spates in cakes. In the evening, rain in grain. I gazed upon the appearance of the storm. The storm was frightful to behold. I went into the ship and battened my door. To the culker of the ship, to Puzur Amuri, the boatman, I gave away my palace with all its possessions. At the first glimmer of dawn, a black cloud rose up from the horizon. Inside the cloud, Adad was thundering, while Shulat and Hanish went on before, moving as a retinue over hill and plain. Eragal tore out the dike posts. Sinurta came and brought with him the dikes. The Anuna gods held torches aloft, setting the land ablaze with their glow. Adad's awesome power passed over the heavens. Whatever was light, he turned into darkness. He smote, dot, 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 the land. It scattered like a pot. For one day, the storm wind, dot, dot, dot. Swiftly it blew. The flood came forth. It was passing over the people like a battle. No one could see his neighbor, nor could this people see each other in the downpour. The gods became frightened of the deluge. They shrank back and went up to Anu's highest heaven. The gods cowered like dogs, crouching outside. Ishtar screamed like a woman in childbirth. And sweet-voiced Belit Ili moaned aloud. Would that day had turned to naught when I spoke up for evil in the assembly of the gods. How could I have spoken up for evil in the assembly of the gods and spoken up for an assault to the death against my people? It was I myself who bore my people. Now, like fish spawn, they choke up the sea. The Anuna gods were weeping with her. The gods sat where they were weeping. Their lips were parched, taking on a crust. Six days and seven nights the wind continued. The deluge and windstorm leveled the land. When the seventh day arrived, the windstorm and deluge left off their assault, which they had launched like a fight to the death. The sea grew calm. The tempest grew still. The deluge ceased. I looked at the weather. Stillness reigned and all of mankind had turned into clay. The landscape was flat as a terrace. I opened the hatch. Daylight fell upon my face. Crumpling over, I sat down and wept, tears running down my face. I beheld the edges of the world, bordering the sea. At twelve times sixty leagues, a mountain rose up. The boat rested on Mount Nemush. Mount Nemush held the boat fast, not allowing it to move. One day, a second day, Mount Nemush held the boat fast, not allowing it to move. A third day, a fourth day, Mount Nemu held the boat fast, not allowing it to move. A fifth day, a sixth day, Mount Nemush held the boat fast, not allowing it to move. When the seventh day arrived, I released a dove to go free. The dove went and returned. No landing place came to view. It turned back. I released a swallow to go free. The swallow went and returned. No landing place came to view. It turned back. I sent a raven to go free. The raven went forth, saw the ebbing of the waters. It ate, circled, left droppings, did not turn back. 
I released all to the four cardinal points. I set up an offering stand on the top of the mountain. Seven and seven cult vessels I set out. I heaped reeds, cedar, and myrtle in their bowls. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded around the sacrificer like flies. As soon as Belit Eli arrived, she held up the great fly ornaments that Anu had made her in his infatuation. Of these gods here, as surely as I shall not forget this lapis on my neck, I shall be mindful of these days and not forget forever. Let the gods come to the offering, but Enlil must not come to the offering, for he, unreasoning, brought on the deluge and reckoned my people for destruction. Suddenly, as Enlil arrived, he saw the boat. Enlil became angry. He was filled with fury at the gods. Who came out alive? No man was to survive the destruction. Ninurta made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, Who but Ea could devise such a thing, for Ea alone knows every craft. Ea made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, You, O warrior, are a sage of the gods. How could you, unreasoning, have brought on the deluge? Impose punishment on the sinner for his sins, on the transgressor for his transgressions. But be lenient, lest he be cut off. Bear with him, lest he fall. Instead of your bringing on the flood, would a lion had arisen to diminish mankind? Instead of your bringing on the flood, would a wolf had risen up to diminish mankind? Instead of your bringing on the flood, would a famine had risen up for the land to undergo? Instead of your bringing on the flood, would pestilence had risen up for mankind to undergo. I was not the one who disclosed the secret of the great gods. I made Arta Hasis see a dream. He heard a secret of the gods. Now then, make some plan for him. Then Enlil came up into the ship, leading me by the hand. He brought me up too. He took my wife up and made her kneel beside me. He touched our brows, stood between us, and blessed us. Hitherto Utnapishtim has been a human being. Now Utnapishtim and his wife shall become like us gods. Utnapishtim shall dwell afar off at the source of the rivers. Thus it was they took me afar off and made me dwell at the source of the rivers. And that's the end of what we have from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, I'm sure you guys recognize huge amounts of similarity. Of course, it's not exactly the same as the flood story that we have in Genesis, or rather, should I say, flood stories that we have in Genesis, since the account that we have in Genesis 6 to 8 is, in reality, two originally separate accounts that were later combined to make the story as we presently have it. But... I'm sure you guys can see the similarity here. And what is striking is that this story is older than the story that we have, or the two stories that we have combined in Genesis. And what's more is that this story that I just read is not even the oldest version. There's an older version in Sumerian literature. And uh, in Sumer is the first place known to history to develop writing. And there's something called the Iridu Genesis. And it talks about making mankind and it talks about basically like a creation account and then a flood story. And uh, Ziu Sudra is the equivalent to Noah in that story. Uh, just like Utnapishtim is the equivalent to Noah in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And so in these stories, you know, we have this, this whole thing with the flood. We have animals and people boarding the flood. We have a deluge that kills all mankind. And there's a, you know, a boat. A description is given of what the boat is like. And uh, 
in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he actually brought seed on board, of course. And there's this flood for a period of time, and then there's the opening of the window of the ark and letting out a bird. And here, you know, you have the raven and the dove and, and uh, a swallow in the Epic of Gilgamesh as well. And then at the end, you have... Of course, the ark is rested on a mountain, and then offerings are made. I mean, this is very strikingly similar. And since these stories predate the writing of the books in the Bible, and it predates Israel, period, it predates Moses, even if one wanted to say that the flood story in Genesis was written by Moses, this stuff predates Moses. It predates Israel, period. And um, the Sumerian one is actually quite old. So that's quite a striking resemblance right there that should let us know that Israel was taking part in heritage of people who came before them. So Yes, they use the name Noah, but they're giving the same basic story as the story of Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And by the way, there is a place in the Dead Sea Scrolls which mentions Gilgamesh. So it shows that they clearly had this idea. And um, so this traces back, and this literature gives us an insight into... (laughs) I'll, I'll put it like this. It shows us the biblical tradition before the biblical tradition. And all that's really saying is that the biblical tradition, in regard to at least some of these things, is not original to the Bible. Whoever wrote the J story with the flood and whoever wrote the P story with the flood um, did not originate that idea. It came from something prior to their time. And it shows some level of agreement. And so it makes one wonder, how far does that agreement go? And we're going to kind of take this and shift this again to more narrowly focus. But I, I wanted to read that from the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's also Enuma Elish, which is a creation story. The first part is very different from what we're used to. It starts with a battle of the gods at the end of which Marduk defeats Tiamat, and then Marduk makes the sky, he divides the waters above and below, and he, you know, does everything with the constellations and the sun and the moon and the stars and and, um, makes animals and and all of that, just like we are used to reading. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of similarity with some of these accounts, And there's a lot of literature there. Now, I want to focus in a little bit more specifically to the Canaanite literature. And the reason for this is because of the connection between the early Israelites and the pre-Israelite Canaanites. Notice, I'm not saying... Israelites and their contemporary Canaanites. I'm saying Israelites and the pre-Israelite Canaanites. Now, there are strong connections between the Israelites and the Canaanites, even to the point where probably the majority of archaeologists of Canaan at the present time say that early Israelites were, in fact, Canaanites. Now, that's something to investigate. I'm not trying to assert that that is the case. But it is rather striking that the culture of the Israelites was almost inseparable from the Canaanites. Hebrew, the Hebrew language, at its earliest stage is practically indistinguishable from Canaanite. Like, it's basically the same language. And then the language ended up, you know, the people groups became separated 
and thus the language developed independently in both people groups and became more and more distinct from one another. But the earlier you go, the further back you go with the Hebrew language, the closer it becomes to Canaanite or Phoenician. And um, that itself is very striking. Like, how could that have come about unless the two people were at one point one? Not only that, but the material culture of the Israelites, as in when archaeologists excavate Israelite sites from the early periods, they are the same as Canaanite sites. Their pottery is the same. If you compare Canaanite pottery with Philistine pottery, it's very different because they are two different peoples. If you compare Canaanite pottery with Egyptian pottery, it's different because they are two different peoples. Canaanite pottery with Babylonian pottery, they are different because they are two different peoples. But Canaanite pottery and Israelite pottery are the same. There's a lot that is the same between Canaanites and Israelites. And then there's, you know, along with the language being the same, there are particular phrases and terms that are the same. Um, as you guys know, Canaanites worshipped... Well, hmm. I said, as you guys know, some of you know this, perhaps some of you don't. The god of the Canaanites, the head god, was named El. He was the head god of the Canaanites. Now, it's really interesting that Israelites worshipped the god El. And evidently, a lot of them did not know that his name was Yahweh until later. Two of the sources in the Pentateuch, E and P, describe the revelation of the name Yahweh only at the time of Moses. But then it's said that Yahweh is El Shaddai. Well, El Shaddai is another name for El, the Canaanite El. So there's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of similarity between the two bodies of literature. So El is a, a big thing. Now here's another thing. Baal or Baal, he was worshipped by Canaanites. But ba Baal is really just a title, which means lord or master or ruler. And the, uh, the actual god that sometimes was called Baal or Baal, his name was Hadad or Adad. But in Israelite literature, even though you don't see the worship of Adad, you do see that Yahweh is called Baal. So Isaiah 54, verse 5, and it's actually plural, which was also done in Canaanite culture. It says, For your Baals are your makers. Their name is Yahweh of hosts. So there you have Yahweh being referred to by the name Baal. Now, there's even Israelite names from the time of David. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 5 mentions someone named Baaliyah. Baaliyah means Baal or Baal is Yah, Yahweh. So at least some Israelites viewed Baal as being Yahweh. Now, I'm not talking about Hadad, which is the god that Canaanites worshipped, which they often called Baal. So it could be that the Canaanites in the days of Israel were saying, no, the true Baal is Hadad, whereas the Israelites were saying, no, the true Baal is Yahweh or Yahweh. But it is interesting how we do have passages in the Bible there are only a few, but there are a few that actually refer to Yahweh using the word Baal or Baal. Then, of course, there are many instances where Yahweh is referred to as El. So, Psalm 95, verse 3, For Yahweh is the great El, the great king over all the gods. The king over all the gods for the Canaanites before the Israelites was El. So here Yahweh is said to be ill. Um, there are many, many passages that have 
these Canaanite ideas, when you look at the pantheon of gods, like the divine council described in Israelite literature, it's the same divine council that's described in Canaanite literature, like in Psalm 82 and all of that. And, you know, you have the 70 sons of God. Well, in Canaanite literature, it talks about the 70 sons of God, the 70 sons of El. So clearly, they're, the Israelites are getting all of this stuff from Canaanites, but it's not that they were getting it from their contemporaries. It's that they were getting it from those who came before them. So there were these Canaanites who came before Israelites were even a thing, and they were saying all of these things, and it can't be coincidental that Israelites continued on with these many, many ideas, like the idea of the divine battle, the idea of the heavenly council, the terms El, El Elyon, El Shaddai, uh, Baal, all of those terms which are then applied to the deity or deities worshipped by Israel were already applied within the Canaanite religion. Moreover, there are psalms and hymns and proverbs in quote-unquote the Bible that are actually just adaptations of older Canaanite hymns. First seven verses of Psalm 19, all of Psalm 29, the, uh, the proverb of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31, are, um, those are all understood by historians and scholars of comparative religion to be adaptations of Canaanite poems. Uh, there's also Psalm 20 is very, very similar to another bit of Canaanite literature. Um, I'll just read you the first line here. May Akru answer us during our siege. May Adonai answer us during our siege. Okay, that's just the first line of this Canaanite hymn. Okay, so in the Israelite one, may Yahweh grant us or grant you triumph in time of siege. The name of Jacob's God be your bulwark. And, and then it goes on, and as you go through, there are several parallels between these two pieces of poetic literature, and the parallels are all in the same order with each other. You know, they're not exact by any means. Like, it's definitely quite different, but they're striking enough of a parallel that something is going on. And then you have, I'll go back to some of these specific phrases that are similar as well. Um, in uh, some Canaanite literature known as KPU, and I won't go on and give all the very specifics, it says, you will take your everlasting kingdom, your dominion of everlasting generations. Psalm 145.13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. I mean, it's just so very similar. Like if we read that in the New Testament and then read the other in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it'd be like, oh wow, look at this similarity. Well, it's the same here, going from this Israelite literature to the pre-Israelite literature. Some of it is just simple phrases, some of it is big ideas. And if it was just one phrase on its own, like I'll give you another example, um, and if it was just that, it wouldn't necessarily be overly significant, but because there's so much of it, and because it's not just simple phrases, it's major ideas that it really causes us to really have to take notice. So in the story of Akat, uh, it says, Ask for life and I will give it to you. For not dying, and I will bestow it upon you. Well, that parallels Psalm 21, verse 5. Life he asked of you, you gave it to him. Length of days, eternity, and everlastingness. At least, everlastingness is one way to translate it. Canaanite literature. The covering of his bed was soaked with his weeping. Psalm 6, verse 7. I drenched my couch with my weeping. Canaanite literature. Son, do not go into a house of drinking. Proverbs 23.30, do not be among wine bibbers. Canaanite literature, my son, do not eat bread with an insulter. Proverbs 23.6, do not eat the bread of a bad person. 
Canaanite literature, do not return a plot. Proverbs 24, 29, do not say, as he did to me, I will do to him. Canaanite literature, mankind does not know what they are doing. Ecclesiastes 6, 12, for who knows what is good for man in life. And Ecclesiastes contains that idea in a lot more than that. Canaanite literature, I eat my tears as my food. Psalm 42, 4, my tears have become my food. You know, I mean, these are expressing sayings that are so similar that it comes from the same root. Like, they share the same culture. There are sayings that we have in North America that are part of North American English that are not shared in Britain. And then you go further away to other languages. Let's just say you go into um, Asian languages. Well, there's certain sayings that they have, different um, idioms that are not shared elsewhere. There are so many shared idioms between Israelites and Canaanites. So there's literally like books and books and books written chronicling all of these parallels. And it's time that we really start taking a look at it. I'll read another passage here. This is from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of El. I will sit on the mount of assembly, on the heights of Saphon, I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like El Elyon. Okay, now that is all very, very similar to what is in Canaanite literature. El, it has the assembly of the gods on the heights of Saphon, and he's called El Elyon. Like, all of that is so, so very similar. Um... I mentioned Psalm 29 a little bit earlier. Uh, I was looking at something in uh, the Yale Angkor Bible series uh, edition of the Psalms. And on Psalm 29, it notes that almost every line of Psalm 29 has its parallel in Canaanite literature. Or I think it said virtually every line and every word. There's just so much parallel here. Another point of parallel. Balaam, the prophet, he's recognized as a prophet of Yahweh in the book of Numbers. You know, Yahweh speaks to him and he faithfully delivers the message of Yahweh. Well, Balaam was recognized by Canaanites as a prophet. Well, why are they both recognizing the same prophet? Could it be that at one point the two peoples were one and that they then split off from each other and Canaanites went astray, basically, and then Israelites were those faithful from among them who continued on? You know, is that a possibility? If not, why not? So anyway, Balaam, he's recognized as a prophet um, he's a Canaanite prophet, but he's accepted by Israelites. Why is that? So he's a, in Canaanite stuff, he's a pre-Israelite Canaanite prophet, but he's accepted by Israelites, just like Dan L that I mentioned earlier. And then you have statements like this from Ezekiel 16, your father was a Hittite and your mother was an Amorite. That's saying that the Israelites actually came from the Canaanite peoples, but, of course, we've never thought that that was actually the case. But what if Ezekiel knew something that we didn't? What if that actually was literally so? Um, anyway, there's, there's a lot more that could be said on this. Um, I'll mention at least one other thing, though. So this is pretty interesting. So this, this whole idea, by the way, guys, um, 
this is something that when uh, Teresa and I, shortly before coming down south here, when we were still up in Hearst, uh, one time we were sitting in a parking lot and I just mentioned to her this idea because it just it came to me at that moment of, you know, hey, this pre-Israelite history and, like, what about the Canaanites before the Israelites and is there anything there kind of this similar things to what I'm saying now other than I'm going into much more detail. And then since then, we have been coming across some things that go in that same direction. And so here's an example. Um, during Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, um, Teresa and I were wanting to understand more of, well, what's this whole idea of building sukkahs and what does the Feast of Tabernacles all really mean? What does it entail? And so we've been wanting to look into it. And then a friend of mine on Facebook, a scholar named Mark Brettler, posted an article uh, from a website which he writes on called The Origins of Sukkot. And it's from a website called thetorah.com, which is basically um, has as its purpose to introduce religious Jews to biblical scholarship. And in this article, it's written by someone named uh, Rabbi Zev Harbor. And he outlines how Sukkot has its origin in the Canaanite calendar. And actually, the whole Canaanite calendar is so very similar to the Israelite calendar. But what is so striking is that there is, in the seventh month, a harvest festival that was in the pre-Israelite Canaanite culture. And as part of this harvest festival, they built sukkahs. They built uh, tabernacles, temporary dwellings. And um, it's just so, so very similar. And they actually built it on top of the temple. And the earliest uh, instructions that we have in the Hebrew literature concerning the sukkahs is that they were to be built on top of the temple. So there's just really interesting parallels there. And it's like, oh, man, it really can't be coincidence that the Israelites were keeping this festival of building sukkahs in the seventh month and the Canaanites were doing that before the Israelites. So there's a couple ways to look at it. Is it that it was originally a corrupt practice and Israel was actually just adopting that practice? Or is it that it's actually a true practice and that that feast and the building of tabernacles and all of that is actually ordained of God, but that it was done so even before the Israelites? And if so, is there a ritual system, a, a festival system, and all of that that was even pre-Israelite that is part of the line of truth? So there's a lot to this, a lot more to look at. Um, at some point in the future, I'm sure we will be studying all of these things more, but the basic idea that I want you guys to take from this is that there is agreement and parallel between Israelite literature and pre-Israelite literature from the ancient Near East, and probably where you have the most striking parallels and the highest amount of parallels is in the pre-Israelite Canaanite literature. And these parallels are no less significant than the parallels between the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, yeah, you know what? For the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a lot of people who were aware, like scholars were aware that there's a similarity between some of the things in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament, but they just said, well, this is helpful background material. 
And guess what? Scholars have also been saying for a long time now that this other literature, this pre-Israelite ancient Near Eastern literature is helpful background material. And it is at minimum that. But what if it's more than that? Like, should we be closed to the idea that our heavenly family was giving messages to people to save them from sin prior to the Israelites? And if so, is it not possible that perhaps there was literature written to convey that message as a product of inspiration? And is it not possible that among the millions of pieces of literature that we have from these pre-Israelite ancient Near Eastern peoples, that perhaps some of that is preserved? Is that not possible? So that's what I want you guys to contemplate. And where this goes, I do not yet know. How much there is, I do not yet know. And what we might learn from it, I do not yet know. But what I do know is that to think that our Heavenly Family was not speaking prior to the Israelites and that we have a few thousand years worth of literature <laughs> that just is totally just disqualified from the table, that makes as little sense as saying that we have these 66 books of the Bible, anything before, in the middle of, or after is disqualified. In other words, anything prior to the canon, between the Testaments, or after the canon is disqualified. So basically what I'm saying is that, just like Paul, remember how Paul, he was saying that, hey, look, it's not just about Israelites. Like he was going back and pointing, he emphasized the Abrahamic covenant, which was a pre-Israelite covenant, and he had a broader view on things. We need to as well. So in a sense, it's like, okay, before we just had 66 books of the canon on the table. And then we added the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, you know what? Now there's a whole bunch of pre-Israelite literature from the ancient Near East. Let's put that on the table too. It's all up for investigation. So, enjoy. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions? Hello? Yes, hello? hello? Yeah. California. Hello, how are, how are you? Doing well, yourself? Good. Um, uh, Rachel invited me to listen, and I did uh, catch uh, probably the last 15 or 20 minutes of your presentation um i guess uh um uh, a lot of what you're saying is is interesting uh it's it's not unlike inspiration uh to have done this before um uh, for instance um uh the holy spirit guided ellen white we know to take portions of things that were written before and include them in her writings. And we had one person who accused her of plagiarism because of it. Um, and I just think that, uh, you know, inspiration, even though there may be many accounts of the flood, the account in the Bible, I would think, is the most accurate it's the one that is above and beyond and better than all the other accounts. Even though there are other accounts um, that may be older, uh, we're talking thousands of years, but um, the Father can, through these human instrumentalities, give the best and the, 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 the most accurate account. Uh, would you agree with that? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, so this relates to a lot of things that 
hmm, that go beyond just the things that we spoke of here in this meeting. So I'll, I'll put it like this. There are people who are on this call who, uh, in going through things that we've gone through in the past, mm-hmm. will perhaps uh, very easily understand why I'm saying some of the things that I've been saying, um, because a lot of what we're saying today builds upon a lot that we have gone through in the past, which has has taken a lot. So you know how um, there are things within the rod message which you couldn't just quickly say to an Adventist and them totally understand it. It would take a lot of like laying the foundation and all of that of different principles and ideas for them to be able to get it. I just wanted sure. to let you know it's the same, it's the same with this. And so basically what I what I think would be good in order for you to really understand not only what I might have to say on this point but to understand why I might say it would be to really um, take a look at our studies that deal with the idea of Scripture canon because there's a lot, like, you know, we all operate within a a certain paradigm, right? There are things that we uh, take for granted as true and that are hugely influential in how we view everything else. And most of us, if not all of us, have grown up within the paradigm of thinking that, well, here we have the Bible, and the Bible is this collection of writings, and this is God's word to us. And yeah, there's more beyond that in terms of like interpretation from the prophets and so on and so forth in modern days, but basically we, we still view it as here we have this particular collection of writings, and that's kind of it. Um, what we've spent a lot of time explaining in other studies is the fact that the idea of a canon of Scripture is, is something which is not actually a scriptural idea. And I'll kind of put it like this. Like, there are many different canons. Like, there's the Protestant canon. There's the Greek Orthodox canon. There's the Roman Catholic canon. There's the Ethiopian Orthodox canon. Ethiopian, all these different yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sure. So you're aware of some of this stuff already, I know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just wanted to mention, like, there are all these canons... And no particular canon is actually advocated by inspiration. And you're aware of Ellen White referring to the Apocrypha and and different things like that. But what we've come to realize... And the wise will understand it. Exactly. Now, what we've come to realize, though, is that even just the idea of a canon, like a set list of writings that people consider to be inspired, that idea of of having a set list is not a scriptural idea. And not only that, but the fact that something has been either included in or excluded from a canon is inconsequential as to whether or not it is actually a product of inspiration or as to whether or not it teaches truth. So in other words, any writing at all from the ancient world or modern world can be placed on the table of investigation. And whether it was included in the canon or not, we have to ask real questions about it. So whether, like, let's say there's the book of Enoch. We can take the book of Enoch and ask, is this true? Is it a product of inspiration? Is it actually written by Enoch? So on and so forth. We can take a writing that happened to be included in the canon. And the Book of Enoch, by the way, was included in a canon, just not the one which we accepted by tradition. We accepted another canon by tradition. So I'll give you another example, actually, rather than the one I was going to. The Book of James. Martin Luther did not believe that James wrote the Book of James. Martin Luther... 
question, and he actually rejected the book of James. And he rejected the, the book of James, that's right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm not saying that he was right in that, but what I am saying is that the principle by which he operated, that led him to not just accept it because it happened to be in the collection that he was familiar with, is a good principle. In other words, just because something is, um, I'll say just because a writing is in the collection that we happened to be born with, doesn't mean that it is true. Even if it is true, that's not the reason. And so because of that, we need to be able to examine everything critically. And just like Martin Luther questioned whether James wrote um, James, we should be able to question whether James wrote James or whether Matthew wrote Matthew or whether Moses wrote the Pentateuch or whether Isaiah wrote Isaiah, whatever it may be. And the answers to those questions may dramatically impact how we view those writings. So in regard to the flood story, to answer your question specifically, the last thing that you said in your question was kind of like, you know, basically the idea that God's version is going to be the, the best one. It's going to be the most accurate. It's going to be the most clear and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, wouldn't God be able to do that even if it's the later one? And in theory, I'll say yes. Like, in theory, yeah, God could do that where the later one could be the more accurate one and all of that. But at the same time, I have to say that it would be wrong of us to say that the one in Genesis is by default the better one because we happened to be raised with it when we haven't really, like, let's take these other ones that are very similar. Well, who wrote the other one? Who wrote, who wrote the one in Genesis? Who wrote the other one? Are both of them products of inspiration? Are neither of them products of inspiration? Is one a product of inspiration and the other not? And there, there are a lot of questions built into that that would need to be asked. And I'm not, I'm not trying to tell anyone right now which one's better or if one is better even. But what I am trying to say is that it's so important for us to be careful not to just accept what we have been accustomed to accept because it's in the Bible, because the Bible is simply a collection of writings, and that collection is a tradition. Not that the, each writing is just a man-made tradition, but that the fact that that particular writing ended up in the Bible is the result of tradition, not the result of inspiration. And so we should be open to investigating everything on its own merits and let the chips fall where they may. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I, I do see where you're coming from. Um, and I, I, uh, I don't think there's a, an inherent evil uh, in studying other writings that predate the Bible. I have a, a set of uh, apocryphal writings and and other things, and um, and I'm, I, I know that uh, you know there are these other links. Uh, it's just that uh, it's it, it's probably a it seems like it's a bottomless pit um, and a very slippery one um, because in short you're you're kind of saying that anything that has been written that has truth in it should be worthy of our time to investigate. I mean, we could go back to, I don't know, just, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. Uh, there's no end. Uh, are, are we saying that anything that is that has truth in it, we should investigate uh, to, because it could be at least that portion which is true is a product of inspiration? and worthy of our time and investigation? That's not actually exactly what I'm saying. Um, Although I'm I'm not disagreeing with that idea either, to be clear. If something is teaching truth, Mm -hmm. then sure, investigate it. But in practical reality, there are 
a lot of things out there, and we have to prioritize. And so in this study, okay. you know, I've, I've, been, I've been kind of pointing at things. Like I'm not just kind of like picking out of the blue. Like I'll put it like this. I'm specifically talking about ancient Near Eastern things and even a particular line of literature within that broader ancient Near Eastern body of works. There's a lot more besides that. Like we could look at ancient Chinese literature, ancient uh, Aztec culture and literature and all of that. I'm not going to those directions. The reason why I was specifying these things is because there are such specific and direct connections to Israelite scripture. So, you know, that's prioritized. And I'm not saying that there is no amount of truth in any of the other stuff from the rest of the world. I'm sure there is. Just like, you know, Victor Hadoff, he talked about Buddha and Gandhi and Muhammad and, and all of these other things. But I'm, I'm talking about something that's a specific line. So, like, for instance, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is an individual who was the founder of a community of Jews 200 years before Jesus, known in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the teacher of righteousness. And there's very powerful and direct evidence that Jesus and his early followers actually considered that individual to be a prophet. And we have some of his writings. Now, there was a lot of other Jews at that time. And, you know, I'm sure it would be useful in some way to read all of that literature and all of the rabbinic literature and all of that. But... That's not what I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on what the teacher of righteousness taught because that is so specifically within this line of truth that it's very much worthy of our attention and time. And while I do not know the specific line of truth, as it were, prior to the Israelites, there's enough parallel within certain bodies of literature from the ancient Near East that is parallel in a harmonious way with early Israelite literature, that what I'm saying is it is worth it for us to take a look there because what might we find that is like, you know, I'll put it like this. We are supposed to live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need everything that has come through inspiration, whether it was after the quote-unquote time of the Bible or between Mm -hmm. the the Testaments or prior to the Israelites. It, It doesn't matter. Whatever comes by inspiration, we want and we need. And I know that it can be overwhelming just because of the sheer amount of material but it's something something that I learned from from uh, neuroscience is helpful, and that is not that I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm just saying I've learned a little bit about it, and what I have learned shows that memory works by the amount of connections you make. So the more connections you can make, the better memory you will have, the longer, the better retention you will have, and so on. It's not like more material will make it more difficult. More material will make it easier. Another example that I've given before is that, you know, someone might say, oh, man, like, I have my New Testament, and there's just so much to read, and I know that Jesus is true, and so I'm just starting here, and I'm reading the book of Revelation, and, yeah, my friends told me to read Daniel, but, man, I need to just focus on uh, Revelation first because there's just too much to read. I can't go back and read everything that came before it. I just need to read Revelation. And then when I understand that, then I'll go back to Daniel. Well, big problem there. You're not going to understand Revelation (laughs) without Daniel. And so here's the thing. The Feast of Tabernacles, just as an example, building the tabernacles and all of that. Yes, Israelites did that. Yeah, we have it in Leviticus. We have it in Exodus, referenced at least. We have it in Deuteronomy. And we're trying to understand it, but what we have in the Bible only says so much. But then there's this pre-Israelite literature, and it talks about basically the same thing. And this is the case not only for the Feast of Tabernacles, but with dozens of other things where there are these parallels. And so, yes, it's a bit more to read, but you know what? That extra time and effort that we put into reading this other material 
will open our eyes to see something like it really is, just like reading Daniel will open our eyes to understanding Revelation. Mm. Yeah. It gives you a, a deeper, broader understanding of maybe why certain things are practiced the way they are, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I do understand that. Okay. Well, I just want to, you know, but the, uh, you, the Bible is still very much uh, an inspired collection of writings. We're, we're not lessening um, the importance of the inspiration of the of the Bible, uh, the Old and New Testaments. I think of, uh, you know, um, the statements in Great Controversy where she talks about the olive trees and she refers to them as the, the uh, writings of the Old and the New Testament. And then the Rod message does uh, build on that. And, uh, yeah, and you're, you're right, I think for... For me and, and most of uh, those in Christendom, we, we see this as a as a sacred collection, uh, and it's uh, it can be a little challenging to uh, to, uh, to to t- to tamper with, you know. But uh, I mean, I like I say, I have apocryphal writings. I have other things that, uh, uh, but but I, I do kind of believe that God is able and is. He, he was wise and is able to and has preserved um, a primary collection of writings, which we now call the Old and New Testament. And uh, I, 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 I don't have a problem with that. I think that he's able to do that. He's able to inspire those who uh, put forth the canon – the general canon that we have um, here in America, I'll say, he's able to inspire one to say, this I want in there, and this one I don't. He's God. He's able to do that. And I, I would just, uh, you know, I would just leave it at that. But um, it's interesting, and I do uh, appreciate uh, the time to listen here and to uh, to hear the points of views that are that are generated here. Well, I certainly appreciate you uh, being willing to ask the questions on uh, such challenging subjects. And sure. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for you to being willing to listen to the answers. Um, I will say that definitely the, the perspective that this message puts forth is mm-hmm. very, very different from what people are used to. Sorry, that's yes. a dog. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. It is. So it's very different. And, you know, I understand that what Ellen White says, or she says Old New Testaments, I understand what Victor Hodov says and, and all of that. Um, and there's a lot that we could go into in discussing the principles involved in regard to those things. Um, mm-hmm. We will very soon have a series of studies uploaded onto the Seven Angels Messages YouTube channel, which is all focused on inspiration and understanding the principles involved with that. Um, And I I think that you would really enjoy and benefit from going through that series of studies. I will briefly say, and we don't have to go into the details because I know we've been on for a while and everything, but just so I don't leave you with the wrong impression, I will say that, like, I'll comment on the last thing that you said, basically, in regard to Ellen White's statements and the idea of the collection that we know of, usually in North America, particularly among Protestants, as the Bible. Um, So just to be clear on what the message teaches on these issues, we actually really do not accept the idea of a biblical canon. Again, I'm not trying to say that that means that we are speaking against any particular writing. That just means that we reject the idea of a biblical canon. But what that does mean is that we do not view these 66 books and this particular collection as being special above another collection or anything like that. I do not believe that just because something was included in this collection means that it is inspired. While it is possible that God could have brought it about so that he gave us a particular collection, 
the overwhelming amount of evidence shows that that is simply not what God did. The New Testament canon of 27 books, the first time someone ever suggested that the New Testament should be composed of the 27 books which we currently have in the Protestant New Testament, was in the year 367, and it was uh, Athanasius, Bishop of Antioch, who made that suggestion. And it took hundreds of years beyond that for that to be agreed upon. The very first time in history, the very first time in history that someone even suggested that the Bible should be composed of the 66 books that we presently have in the Protestant canon was the year 1559 A.D. And it was John Calvin, who is the you know, founder or father of Calvinism, which I know that no Seventh-day Adventist uh, agrees with. <laughs> Not that that is evidence against the canon, but just to say, I don't think that many Adventists would say that he was like the voice of God to establish what is to be the Word of God. But that's 1559. No one before 1559, we have no evidence that anyone before 1559, the Walden Seas, Martin Luther, anyone, when they thought of the word Bible, thought of the 66 books of the present canon. And even in Protestantism, that 1559 date where John Calvin suggested that these would be the books of the Bible, that did not settle it for Protestants. For the first 200 years of Protestants, many Protestants, especially in Europe, had the books James, Jude, Hebrews, and Revelation as a separate category in their Bibles called New Testament Apocrypha, and many of them did not accept those books as a product of inspiration. In mm -hmm. short, the 66-book canon is the canon of apostate Protestantism, and Seventh-day Adventists should rise above that apostate Protestant tradition, which early Seventh-day Adventists were actually starting to do, and they were arguing in favor of the inspiration of the wisdom of Solomon and Second Estrus. So there's basically a, a lot to that. When Ellen White uses the term Bible, she does not strictly mean the 66 books of the uh, Protestant Bible that we have today. She says that Wycliffe published the Bible. He brought the Bible to the English-speaking people. Well, his Bible included 15 more books in it than the Protestant canon. She said that Luther fell in love with the Bible. And she uses the word Bible. But clearly, that did not include James, Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation, and Esther, and other books as well. So, it's just, when Ellen White's using these terms, she's speaking more generally of the Word of God. And I think it's important not to use her more general statements about this when she's not even talking about the issue of a scripture canon. She's not addressing the same questions that we're addressing today in order to um, kind of support the traditional view. The idea of the Protestant canon is not something that was given to us through inspiration. It is something that developed within apostate Protestantism, which some of the Adventists have always identified as Babylon. And I know it's a big change in thinking, but really what this message is advocating, it, it is not advocating a mild change of thinking in regard to the Bible and the Bible canon. It is advocating a dramatic change. And I understand, just so you know, like, I'm not saying this in order to convince you or to say that you should view it exactly as I view it or anything like that. Sure, I understand. But I, understand that. I didn't want to leave you with the impression that we still kind of do say, oh, well, there is some sort of preference or priority with the 66 books of the canon. I just wanted the position of the message to be clear, and then you can investigate that and test it on its own merits. And one last question for you, based on what you just said. Uh, has sure. the branch message, or has any, uh, is there, are there other, um, I'm saying, that, so there's not there's not just 66. If there are, let's say, uh, 12 others uh, that you may feel that are inspired, or the branch message feels that are inspired, or have they been identified, uh, you know, 
could we i mean you know if the book of enoch if you feel that that could be added then we could say well we, you know it could be 67 or it could be uh the book of ezra that could be uh, 68 how many have we have you personally identified that could actually add to the common 66 that we that we most christians commonly hold i'm curious okay sure um, now i have to say though in order that question is one concerning which i cannot simply answer oh, okay because okay. Of, because because of the fact that it well i'll put it like this the way that you're putting the question um it is evident from the way that you are putting it that you're operating within the canonical paradigm. So it's almost like thinking that we're advocating maybe a different canon, a canon with more books in it. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that we reject the idea of canon. So I'm not trying to say 66 books plus. I'm, I'm trying to say let's not make a list. Let's not put it together. Let's investigate each writing on their own. I'm, I'm not trying to say even that you should accept all of the books that are among the 66 that we have. Because I really, oh, I'll put it like this, I don't know anyone who has accepted each book within the Protestant canon by trying the spirits, by testing them to see whether it is true or anything like that. People accept it because they were raised with it or they join a church and that's the accepted canon. In other words, we accept it because of a tradition which we accept by birth or by entering a particular society of a religious community. But that's not right. That's not what we're supposed to do. You know, Paul, he wouldn't have people accept what he said without investigating it first. And the same thing, the Law of Moses says that we're to test the prophets and all of that, but yet people don't do that today when it comes to the writings in the Bible. So what I'm saying is that every writing, including those in the Bible, needs to be investigated and tested, not accepted a priori. We shouldn't just assume that it's true. We should actually test it and be our noble Bereans, like we always say, and, and we should do the same with other writings. And if it turns out that 5% of the writings in the 66-book canon is all that's inspired from that, and 20% from the Apocrypha is, and 50% from the pre-Israelite uh, literature is, then that's what we would go with as inspired. And by the way, I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm just giving you an example that would be kind of like, on the extreme end of what, <laughs> what you might consider to be shocking, right? Like, if that was the case, that would seem pretty shocking. But I'm just saying, like, this message is truly open to wherever things fall according to the evidence. And even if that was to be the case, we would go with that. So, um, it, um, so, uh, one member of the branch could say that I've studied the 66 um, uh, books of the Bible and I found that 20% of them are inspired. And another member uh, could say I've studied it and I found that 56% uh, is inspired. And, and this is the type of openness that is, uh, is encouraged and, and common and allowed. Is that, is that what we're saying? Well, I'll put it like this. In the branch... Uh, well, hmm. here's the thing. When we talk about openness, people often mean different things. Branches are encouraged to be open to any conclusion, any idea, but branches are only encouraged to be open to the evidence. So it's not that the branch advocates that, oh, let's just have every one of us kind of find which books we like and the other ones that we don't like and, you know, go with whatever. It's not in any sense a free-for-all in terms of just accepting and rejecting things. It's simply this, that we are very strict to going with evidence, and that's it. And the fact is that 
the idea of a 66-book canon does not stand up to evidence and does not have evidence in its favor, and so we don't accept that idea. Anything else that comes along is something that we have to examine on its own right and go with whatever the evidence is. So I'll put it like this. If you ask the branches here, you know, they're here on the call, I don't believe that there's a great deal of difference in how we view different writings among us. Like, I really don't think that there is. And the reason why is because we are not taking the perspective of, well, let's just all investigate and whatever you find, go with that, and whatever someone else finds, go with that. No, we hold each other accountable to the evidence. And if someone says, I believe that this writing is a product of inspiration, well, okay, what's the evidence for that? And some might say, well, I believe that this other writing is not a product of, of inspiration. Okay, well, what's the evidence for that? And so the strictness to the evidence is what keeps it bound together in unity. And really, that's, that's kind of the only way to, to be that would actually lead us to the truth. Okay. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand better. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Wonderful. So, and it's just, and you're open to, you know, if someone investigate this, then they bring that to the table. Sure. Okay, I got it. Fair enough. Okay. Absolutely. I don't want to. I don't want to keep us on. We can talk another time with some other things. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, I appreciate your questions, and I hope that it was edifying for everyone. I am sure it was. Um, so we should wrap up the meeting, but I will just ask if. Anyone else does have any burning comments or questions before we bring it to an end? I just want to say it was very interesting and uh, it's exciting. So, yeah, thank you, Heavenly Sister. Amen. Okay, cool. Would anyone like to thank our Heavenly Family and then we'll close off? I can. Heavenly Family, we just want to once again glorify your name in this day of the new moon. Uh, your evidence of your leadings and guidance, which is truly just amazing love, has been once again portrayed today, you know, in this call by revealing to us more and more of your truth that you want us to obtain especially now um, this current revealing of the pre-Israelite Canaanite literatures. And we ask for your guidance in the future, um, in this path, and we thank you so much for just being amazing gods that will lead us into all truth. Toda Eloheinu B'Shem Simak. In the name of Branch, Amen. 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 All right. Love you all very much. Happy New Moon. Shalom. Happy New Moon.